Welcome to the Blink Podcast. Welcome to a very special edition where we're going to be talking about the required steps and insights into becoming a high performer, but also some insights for those high performers that are not feeling like they're getting anything done. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Blink Podcast. My name's Darren Prattley, and we are excited to have a special guest with us today. So first of all, I'm going to invite my usual co-host, Jonathan Creek, all the way from across the ditch. Jonathan, welcome aboard, mate. And I'm really excited to introduce our fantastic guest, Pancho Metro- Marotra. Better get that right. That's, that, that's close. That was close. Uh, from Front, Front, Frontier Performance. Uh, and one of the best parts about this is it's an opportunity for us to finally get a chance to do some work together. So it's really cool to have you uh, on board with us today, Pancho. Very cool. I'm very, very pleased to be here. Thank awesome. you, Pancho. Uh, firstly, before we get started, how did Darren go with your surname? Uh, it could be better. Okay. Got work to, to do, Darren. I've got some work to do on that. I've got some work. <laughs> yeah. Pancho, just give us a quick snippet of the Pancho backstory so that it puts everything that we speak about moving from this part forward in context. Where have you come from? How did you get into this field? And what is it that you love to do most? Gosh, uh, that's a really long answer to this one. I'll give you a real short one. Um, I uh, originally a long time ago in New Zealand, uh, I used to go and sell um, everything from hardware to but I found my passion in selling door-to-door uh, life insurance, and I got really, really good at it. And um, as a as a as a twenty-year-old, I was uh, geez, I was up and down the country, and I, I set records selling uh, life insurance policies that used to do about a hundred a week. And uh, yeah, and uh, people often ask me, "How the hell did you do that kind of volume?" I says, "I got up early, <laughs> knocked on a lot of doors." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And, did, did you and, ever did you ever happen to go and knock on the doors of my favorite town in New Zealand? Uh, which which town was that? Darren? Oh, that's Huntley. Huntley. Yeah. I did I did the whole North North Island. Everything I used to they they found out that I was really really good at at not taking a no. And so they used to send me to all the difficult places like Tokoroa where the timber um uh, town as you know and i used to yep. knock on the doors all the you know all the samoans and the tongans and the maoris and i just wouldn't take a no for the for an answer and so i used to sell a lot down there and then a uh, long journey forward i came over to australia about 30 odd years ago and I, I think i was pretty good in selling but then i uh i started working as as you do when you leave your country in a call center and i worked at american express and i got very very good at selling uh, cards cold over the phone so then i set up my own call center i did my uh, stuff in uni um have a background in cognitive behavior and uh quite a few years ago i went to harvard and um did a specialized course in negotiation and deal making so um deal making negotiation and influence is a big part of my background and it, it's actually interesting when 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 you do training in CBT, a lot of the training is uh, when you first start is actually sitting down with people and doing counseling work. And which really gives you an insight into how people can think the most irrational emotions and can, will not see reality. And so I did it because it taught me the use of emotions in influence and how you can actually trigger certain people and trigger certain responses that actually to a certain extent allow you to influence and persuade people very very quickly once you understand how how the mind works and how people can be so easily influenced if you do it correctly and so that was my journey and then um uh, through you know teaching uh, doing my own sales i got asked to do training for an organization a very big telco over here in australia and i thought some of the stuff that i knew was everyone knew but i didn't and so i started teaching them and um it's interesting when you do work on psychology people think it's because you want to help other people it's actually the first person you want to help is yourself and you want to understand what makes you tick 
why is it that some days that you can perform at such a high level that you're just in that flow state where everything you touch is turns to gold then suddenly a few days later on you can't understand why you're not performing at that level and this was something that i wanted to fix up within myself so it's this is a part of life going up and down but what we have a choice of is how far we go down and what i wanted to know is could i develop the self-awareness that when i'm coming down that i can actually stop myself and pick myself up and get myself up again which is invariably what you see with high performing sports people all the time they have this innate ability um, to manage their emotions in the moment because they have they have the ability to be present and being present is talked about a lot but a lot of people actually don't know how to do it and um if you know as you know tennis is a big part of my background and if you watch the top three that have been at the top for the last 15 18 years what is it that they do so well that they can manage their stress levels and make the right decisions under pressure that the players that are 10 years younger can't do and it's this emotional regulation um, and high performance thinking is not just about you know if we're going to that topic of resilience it's it's actually a whole uh, a whole bunch of other areas your ability to learn your ability to take criticism your ability to take feedback and your ability to actually embrace uncertainty and fear to change um, and um, if you know if we're talking about this in a little bit deeper I always get asked I got asked by a sales guy last week and he said Pancho before I do anything I need to feel confident I'm going to do it I said you've got it all in the wrong order confidence is a feeling and on the opposite side of the coin is courage and so before that if you want to feel confident the first stage is actually commitment to change how you know do you will you step forward into the unknown and commit to learning something new that is going to take you take you out of your comfort zone totally and that you're going to probably fail at your first attempt will you attempt that and I, and I think that's one of the key areas, isn't it? It's that fear, that fear of failure. Because I always sort of talk to people at the start of a presentation about, you know, the comfort zone, the idea of, you know, how much success do we achieve in that comfort zone area? And then, you know, when you dig down into what's comfortable and getting out of that comfort zone, that whole fear of failure of the first try of I'm going to have a go at it and it's not going to work. So that means I'm not any good at it. So I'm not going to do it is yes. such a powerful feeling that stops people just even getting the first paddock gate open. Yeah. Um, you know, they all, they all, um, the real key thing is uh, what comes before courage is actually commitment to doing something. You know, it says, will you get to that stage whereby you say, I've just got to get this handled in my life. I cannot keep on putting up with this situation in my life any more longer. Yep. Will I take that first stage and commit myself to learning this and giving it a go? I mean, you know, sports is a great metaphor for high performance. Look how many times for high performing sales team, uh, high performing rugby teams, tennis players, any kind of team iterates. They're always evolving. They're always committed to change. To changing yep. what they're doing because they know what they, what won them last year won't win them next year. Yet, when and specifically when we talk about salespeople, they see all this high performing, they never think about it that these people are doing something new every time, every time. You know that their old adage is, "If it ain't broke, don't don't fix it." <laughs> mm. <laughs> With the top go, if it's working, and it's fine to be the Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, so let's let's look at the current market. You, you mentioned that you work with a lot of real estate. Darren and I also work with a lot of real estate and plus other areas like finance and recruitment and any sort of areas that have people facing sales teams. Yes. Um, firstly, well done on the door knocking of in selling insurance because I, I actually couldn't think of anything worse to do. But if you if that's how you, you know, if that taught you and led to where you are now, well done. I think when you look back at people's lives and, find jobs that they did that other people wouldn't do. Well, uh, I didn't know any better. 
well, that's, it was, that, that, you still did it. I'm sure there was other things you could have been doing, but that well, like it was actually interesting because um, I went to the states. Uh, I went to try and make it as a tennis player, and I came back with some really bad injuries where I couldn't walk for about six months because my knees blew out. And I thought, what the hell am I going to do? You know, I'm washed up at 20. And I, go, I saw this paper, commission only salesperson. I said, Jesus, I never had a job before. So I, just the only thing that tennis taught me was competitiveness. Um, and so I said, and the guy just told me, hey, you have to sell 10 policies a week. I said, oh, okay. I thought, okay, well, I'm going to do it. If that's what I had to do, then I had to do it. And I just did it. I didn't know any better. <laughs> Great resilience, though. I think that sort of job, I mean, you wouldn't get, you know, Darren and I have both got kids in teenage years, and I think we would both sort of look at each other and scratch our heads if we were to ask our kids to go and do that sort of a job. It just wouldn't happen. Like, I just, I think the world's moved a bit. But let's just apply this back to the, where the world is at the moment. You work, as I said, with real estate as we do. What are you seeing in the market at the moment? And what, what are you seeing as the biggest challenges that they need to get over? Uh, what I'm seeing in the market is obviously uh, straight in New Zealand, there's, uh, the interest rates have risen. So that's making a huge impact on decision making by vendors and buyers. Um, the, the biggest impact is, that is actually happening is that um, a lot of salespeople have never experienced adversity. Um, they are totally unprepared uh, to have challenge, challenging conversations with both vendors and buyers. And a lot of them actually lack the skills uh, to um, have uh, conversations with clients to be able to learn to, to actually negotiate. Um, I see such a lack of skills in the art of negotiation. Um, it seems like uh, within five minutes of a conversation, it's a race to the bottom to cut your fees to get the business. Um, the, the, there is absolutely, and I see it everywhere, there's just such a lack of skills in the ability to actually understand what negotiation and frame and influence is all about. It's just, um, I don't know why that is the case. And it seems to be that um, so many of the conversations are, are, are so light in substance. I want you to talk a bit more about this because I want you to talk about this because this is one of the things that's getting me right at the moment and it's the uh, the inability to actually realise that you're going to have to have a conversation that goes on for longer than five minutes yeah. to actually get down into some of the real issues that are affecting people, that are challenging people, or even discuss their thinking about why they've made their mind to stay out of the market or not do what they what they were going to do because of circumstances. But just the willingness to have these conversations yeah. is just not in the market right now. And I, I think you were, you were bang on about, you know, over the last – five years or for the last four years anyway you've had an environment where pretty much as long as you introduced yourself well you had a reasonably good suit you drove a maserati and you put a real estate sign <laughs> up out the front your yeah. chances are you were going to get the listing right yeah, whereas yeah. right now man you got you got to actually show a high level of skill yeah um if we take a step back um one trait or one behavior that impacts on all this even before the meeting is the area of procrastination and core reluctance yeah um oh this uh, is a good topic yeah so um i'm with uh, i'm training one particular agency at the present moment and um and i and because call cold calling is something that i actually enjoy uh, because I've done it for a long period of time. I had my own call center and uh, for about 13 years, we had our call center doing all the cold calling for Hewlett Packard and Dell. So, te so technicality, you're not doing the cold calling. You got people doing the cold calling for you. Cold calling is a bane of this podcast. Pancho, if you could help people get over it, I tell you, it'd well, be uh, amazing because it really, it's an ongoing topic, isn't it, Darren? Yeah. Cold calling, the fear well, of cold calling. I, 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 actually, I actually did the cold calling when... Um, 
I actually set up the, the, the call center nearly 20 odd years ago for AT&T over here in Australia. And they asked me to come in and run it and manage it. So I would actually do the calling and selling selling uh, telecom services over the phone. And so I set up my own call center and I had 13 people on the phones of which I was one. And I've done over something like 220,000 cold calls. So uh, and about four weeks ago, I'm sitting in an agency and I'm taught and I'm teaching them around the mentality of a cold caller. There's a specific way that I think, and I wanted to share that with the team. And I said, okay, now let's make some cold calls. And they said, what? And I said, um, yeah, <laughs> I said, how many people's said, phones oh. pretend to ring at that moment and they walk out? And the phone feels like a hammer, right? It's, it's like a, one of those jack hammers. It's so heavy. So the I said, room no, went no, cold. <laughs> it's cold. It's really cold, cold metal. Right. And so I said, guys, give me the phones. I said, what do you mean? I'll make the call in front of you. So I had 20 people there. And I put the phone on and I'm calling someone and because of the way I designed the scripts, they're, they're so much different. They got meetings and it took me an hour to work on their mindsets before they got comfortable enough and they started using the script and within one and a half hours, they had booked $400,000 worth of new revenue by doing it because I forced them to do it. And, and Pancho, this is the, that's what I'm so. That's why I'm so pleased you're on this call with us because this is the insights that this marketplace right now is really struggling with. Right, they are really struggling with this ability to be able to go. Actually, I need to start thinking differently about the way I connect to the market and the way I have different conversations and get out of this get out of this headspace that just means that I'm going to only deal with people that I know. Yeah, and so you, you, uh, I get asked, "What is procrastination?" And so it's a really, uh, it's a really uh, deep topic. But procrastination is not about it's not about task avoidance. People think it's about task avoidance, like I, I, I've got a call sheet. I, I, it's actually more about the fear of failure, because yeah. if I attempt this and I fail at it, I'll be seen as a failure by That's other it. people. That's but, it. That's it. Yeah. I'll be seen as a failure by myself. Yeah. Which is worse because it impacts on my self identity, my self worth, yep. who I think I am. So let me not actually do those calls because I might actually fail. And so what what we see is people making all kinds of excuses not to pick up the phone. And so call reluctance becomes a habitual way of thinking. Yep. And so um, we've and for example, uh, in this one agency that I'm training at the present moment, I've got around about 15 to 20 salespeople, and there's three that have just totally embraced what I've done. And they've gone, and this is cr these are crazy stats. Um, they've gone from getting uh, three to four appraisals a week to 12 in seven days. And now they're up to 20 in 15 days that is just an amazing that's a statistic. that's a cold caller ringing yeah oh that's <laughs> <some problem. laughs> uh, but you know um, you talk about procrastination and hey i'm on team procrastination here i'm back i'm, I'm on the side of all the procrastinators who yeah. listen and subscribe to this show because sometimes i can be here ready to go and look out the window and there'll be a branch or a weed that needs to come out of the garden and then yeah. that leads me to doing other things in the garden. And then the dog needs the ball thrown. Yeah, yeah. there's all these things that need to be done. Social media. The, the call. The calls can work. Right? <laughs> That's right. And then it's being a social media, media, being a social media guy, but, I, you know, I then have to do my research on YouTube to work out what's trending at the time and just yeah, yeah and monitor so, all that. And and so the the biggest uh, problem that most salespeople don't understand it's endemic not only in real estate it's, it's across technology manufacturing is that the what you learn by actually making the calls is transferable into other parts of the sales process and this is what most salespeople in real estate actually don't get technology salespeople get it to a certain extent i'm not saying they get it they're at 20 percent understanding whereas real estate people are less than two percent what happens is that when you get really good at this aspect it's like um 
you transfer those skills on being able to hold a conversation and being disciplined to understand that when you are calling, you are not there to sell your knowledge, you're there to sell the appointment. And it's a very big discipline because what most salespeople do is that when they're on the call, because they actually, this is the reason why they talk so much on the phone, because they want self valid they want self validation from the client to say, Hey, I like you value me, do all this. And let me tell you about the knowledge I have about your market. And the guy and the client on the other guy goes, Oh, thanks very much. Uh, and I'll come back to you if I'm interested. So they actually have no discipline understanding what this is all about. And then the, they lack the structure on the sales process to actually understand um, when they do meet the client, there's a whole bunch of um, information that you should have, that you should have an understanding of how the client thinks and behaves when you meet the client. So because the salespeople do not actually understand the higher levels of what, you, what they're doing by doing that cold call, they actually miss huge opportunities when they do arise it for themselves and when they meet the client, which is one of the reasons why they default into feed negotiations so quickly. Okay. I get it. So I get that. I like it so good. Now, Pancho, before we end this podcast, we've still got a long way to go, by the way, but I want to make sure that we get this in. I want you to give us the keys to a cold call. What are the steps? What are the psychological steps that someone has to go through yeah. to pick up the phone, do the cold call, close the appointment and hang up and high five themselves. Well, how do we go from nervous Nelly sitting in a chair yeah. watching YouTube because that's important to them not yeah. to fail yeah. and that's how they hide it through to how to consistently just get on a roll and that flow state of cold calling. Cause I, I tend to find that if I get up early, don't get distracted by anything and start making the calls, I can keep making them one after the other, after the other, after the other. But it's the actual first one is the hardest. Yeah. So um, it's actually interesting. I have ran a what we call the brain science of appointment setting workshop yesterday for a very large technology company, and whereby they have very specific objectives to be met every week, like weekly targets for meetings. And one of the what makes calling and appointment setting so so um, successful is organization first is to actually spend some time to get your databases ready to have your space ready to know what and to have a routine in place whereby hey you, you know because business development in any form is crucial to success in sales say that again say that again business development in any form is crucial crucial for sales success so that so, again so that was that was really good i love that like can i just want to emph can we get that like when flashing lights jonathan because that is gold 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 jerry so what that means is that uh even if when i when i'm doing it for myself and i i actually get withdrawal symptoms when i can't cold call well, I've got I, some for you to do. Anytime you're feeling a, you know, a bit worried about it, I, 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 I just palm off to you, okay? I, I actually did it for a commercial agency. They said, we've only got mobile numbers, and I was doing a demonstration. I go, that's all I need. Yeah. Don't, you don't need to even give me the name. I'll have a conversation. And I go, what is with this guy? But yeah. let's go back to the first quote. Let's go first, through. So first, organization, first, space. Get your one. databases ready. Yeah. It's absolutely crucial. And one of the most important things about databases is that you want a system that allows you to make calls one after the other. You don't want to be going here, then another one there and looking like this. That just kills a whole rhythm. So uh, in our business, we have what we call a sales tracker. So this information, I can make calls consecutively one after the other, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. And that's and so I don't use a CRM system, and so this data then gets automatically transferred into the CRM system. I don't use a CRM for making calls, because when I'm making calls, I want to do one after the other, bang, 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 bang. I have my scripts ready. So uh, a lot of people talk about not having scripts. We have scripts at work. Um, I know because I have certain scripts that uh, have been iterated over the past, you know, 20 years. But they, when I say it, 
I have an 80% appointment ratio rate because everything is one. If we know our numbers, so roughly I know my numbers that if I make 30 phone calls, I'll generally have around about five to seven conversations. And from there, I'll get around about four meetings. And from there, I'll usually get two to three meetings, two to three deals. I know my numbers like the back of my hand. So I know my numbers before I even step forward. So one of the key things is I'm mentally rewarding myself every time I pick up the phone. I, I know what each dial actually it generates in business for me. So whether you say no to me, whether you say F off to me, or you hang up, or you're, it's a wrong number, I'm mentally rewarding myself every time I pick up the phone. Okay, I just made myself 1500 bucks, thanks very much. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. So my mental state is a lot different to, I don't, I don't, I don't get rejection. But also, and then it comes down to having the script set up. And it goes to my calling times are between nine and 11 o'clock, virtually two to three days a week. And uh, I have a business development guy who's into another market. He's doing it three hours a day. And so we're very disciplined around this. In fact, one of our clients, Bell Property over here, um, the owner of the business is so disciplined that there are no meetings, no vendor meetings, no buyer meetings between the hours of nine to 12. Everyone is on the everyone. You, he's got a, he's got a video of everyone on the phone calls at that time. It's a it's a military operation. And so, yeah, discipline right. is key. Discipline is key. Uh, we do and how a many of, call, how many calls in those two hours on average? For myself or for the for the real estate guys? No, for you. Oh, for me. Um, or for anyone listening, what do you reckon? Like for it to be taken seriously, what do they have to reach? Okay, so I've got a 25-year-old who has been working with me for a couple of years now. Uh, he'll punch out nearly 70 calls a day, and he last year he took 2.1 million uh, gross commissions. Um, it, it's not bad. When he started with me, he was a 24-year-old. He's now 25 and a half, 26. And so he's very disciplined around. He'll, he'll punch out 70, 80 calls. So I've got a 27-year-old who does 250 calls a week and he averages uh, nine appraisals a week and he'll punch out, he'll get to close to a million dollars in GCI this year. Obviously they follow the formula that I'm teaching them regarding the script. They, they, you could not tell they're reading from a script, but we do a lot of role plays. Like they are so natural with it that you could not tell the difference and they've got it laminated. I know, because I gave it to them, eliminated, and it's and they're reading it off. But now they they just glance at it because it's so. Everything I do is structured, even from there to the sales process. It's it's structured. But Jonathan, you can... Jonathan, you know, you know, you and I have talked about this, right? When you hear that type of discipline and that type of focus around the the attributes of a good salesperson today, you think about the environments that we work in. Like that there would really challenge a lot of people in their day-to-day -day work environment because that, that isn't the approach that most of the people we work with would take. Yeah, they're frightened of it. Yeah. No, they it's, wouldn't take it. it. It's sort of, I think it evokes images of 1970s style business, noisy rooms with lots of phone calls, tally marketing type stuff, but actually... You know, sometimes, even though the world evolves, I think that sometimes business doesn't have to evolve and that techno technology doesn't have to reinvent the model. It just helps you. So I was really interested, Pancho, that you said you don't use the CRM until after you've got the data. You stick to your own system and habit. I think for the listeners and people watching, there's probably a bit of a process in there for them to work out what system and process works for them. But if they're sitting here and listening or watching at the moment and the process isn't working at all, probably yeah. adopting yours to start with is a good place to begin, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a good comment. One of the um, uh, people that I trained uh, uh, quite a few years ago, his name was Gavin Rubenstein. He's one of the top agents over here in Ray White. And he'll tell you uh, off, off the record that he sees himself as a glorified telemarketer. And he's number three in Ray White. Yeah. So um, it's the, you know, people think they're working hard, but they're not. 
people think they're working structured they're not people are looking for a um, an easy process to be successful there are none um, the strangest thing that actually happens is that when you talk to any of the uh, people that I train um, they'll actually come back to you and tell you that they're actually in the flow state whereby everything is working because they have such a discipline around what they're doing not only do they succeed in their career but they're actually succeeding in all aspects of their lives because they're in that flow state whereby things are just happening they don't actually suffer of uh, suffer inaction or anxiety they are actually so forward thinking in that they have their days mapped out the, one of the guys that i trained he says yeah i was up at five o'clock in the morning um, i'm listening to your uh, uh training program pancho and one of the key things is that i'm hitting my personal bests at the gym as well so that kind of thinking and behavior translates so all, adds all aspects of your life and and this is one thing that a lot of people and i would go very very specific in the real estate industry just don't get they think it's all about the hype they think it's all about working hard and working hard is 50 percent of the game but if you don't get the other part of the game you're destined to actually spend years on the treadmill trying to figure out why you're not progressing and it's the hard conversations that the, the sales people don't want to have which is what prevents them from actually doing it you know like i know that if i hit it hit 90 phone calls in a week i'll get my income targets no mm -hmm. questions no I think, questions i think what's interesting is not just real estate this isn't yeah. just real estate no. and i think if we think bigger than just cold calls it actually yes. is conversations and appointments that lead to yes. opportunities and i'll give yeah. you an example uh pancho you're not aware of this but my uh, next door neighbors here is it's a big empty block of land and big nasty developers are going to come in and try and overdevelop this beautiful part of the world down here in the leafy east of melbourne and so the other day in my fight for justice uh to represent the people of the good neighborhood i went and door knocked 50 neighbors i wasn't selling insurance but i was selling the ideal the fact that they could lose their ideal lifestyle if they let these greedy yes. developers come in and overpopulate now i can tell you right now that those conversations it took me five hours mind you yeah. i have made <laughs> an incredible amount of connections and friends with mm -hmm. people that i've lived within 50 to 100 meters of for 16 years yeah. and knew nothing about them so now, jonathan is there a bell ringing can you hear that I, bell ringing yeah yeah no no i get it darren i'm all this is mm -hmm. i'm all about this now this is but this is like i know jesus rose only a couple of days ago <laughs> but uh i'm i've come out i've come out of the cave myself <laughs> not, the, not, not the closet the cave yeah now here's the thing i've got a, a another business person that i deal with um that likes classic cars and one of the people yeah. that i met in the door knocking scenario has led me to a nest egg collection of classic cars that are up for sale that will yeah. probably lead towards a three and a half to four million dollar deal exchanging yeah of which the guy who's buying saying well of course you're going to get the broker fee and i'm like well no i don't want the broker fee i'm just connecting you but yeah. what i'm sort of saying to you is the opportunities that are just coming from conversations and when you talk about the cold calling and the scenario yeah. of don't sell your product online just get the coffee yeah then meet the and person on a human level because i'm all about being yeah. human like yeah. human to human you can use digital tools but you've got to have a human to human conversation yeah then from there your sales your sales probably if you're having a half an hour meeting your sales pitch probably comes in at the 26 minute mark of that half an hour meeting and if they yeah. like you you get it done am i yeah. right and, and and so the the real lesson that the metaphor from your experience was you went out to meet people you didn't have an agenda you went out to have a conversation you hit a pain point you generated emotion you got people to buy in so this is one of the keys of influence is that if you want to be a really really good 
and I call a really good negotiator or a salesperson is stop trying to be a salesperson. Don't wow. sell, serve. And so that what what that means is that your whole communication is more about having an open dialogue with someone, educating and getting drawing in, but having a very strategic in that you you do know what you're trying to achieve if you're talking to someone and it's and at the end of the day if the pain if the person that you're talking to has a pain or a problem and you can raise that very very clearly you, you are you're in the mix of actually solving that and so people need to understand this and therefore a lot of the training within especially in the real estate sector it, it, it is so um, what I feel outdated. It was done in the 70s and people have changed. Customer psychology has changed. Keep, and so it, this is about having a conversation, structured conversation. And it's it's about opening the dialogue and saying, well, listen, you know, if you have a problem and I've created a scenario whereby I've actually identified a problem that you could have, I have a potential solution. Should we explore this further? And, you know, I got one of the biggest tech deals by having a conversation like that with the sales director by actually saying that. And he goes, yeah. The bit that I really love about it too, and this is the piece that I think your, your positioning on this is dead right, Pancho, is that when Jonathan went out to knock on the doors, he was going out there to, because he was passionate about his topic, yeah. Yeah. And he really wanted to connect with his community because he was doing something that was good. Yes. And because he believed in all of that, he could have gone and talked to a thousand people because yeah. he actually had the belief that what he was doing. Now, now, if you if you're in the sales process, the thing is what you've got to be thinking about is understanding your product value, the product, what what it will do for your customer and have the passion about that solution and what it does for your customer because that gives you the head positioning that you're out there helping and as you use the word serving your community because it takes you away from that sense of i'm here to sell you something and and as you say that mentality has just gone from our current psyche because if any client out there is in a situation where they get a sniff that you might they might be being sold at they'll run a mile well, no one actually asked the question, why do so many vendors um, get multiple salespeople to come in uh, yeah. to pick the services? It's because they're actually looking for a connection with a salesperson who gets them. And which is, and when they see all the salespeople are all the same, then the conversation invariably goes down to price. It's a race to the right. bottom. And, yep. and so the salesperson actually, they don't actually understand. They have a lack of skills. Yeah. Pancho, yep. I do find this, I find this incredible, and you're in Australia, I'm in Australia, you're in Sydney, I'm in Melbourne, and I look at all the real estate conferences that go on, particularly the kickstarts at the start of the year, yep. and yep. this year I made the strategic decision not to involve myself in the kickstarts, the strategic, because I just felt as though you go and do the kickstarts and then the follow-up employment wasn't there with the big brands, right, because they're like, we've already heard from you, uh, we'll come yep. back next year. And I always find this staggering when I look at the rundowns of all these events that it's the same sales trainers, yeah. uh, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And then, and then you go into these offices and work with them. And I'm all about, you know, I or I profile the people. I don't use, I don't. What's that thing, Darren? That that you talk about all the time? Disc. I don't use Disc. any of those sorts of stuff. I actually use my psychology background and identify the archetypes of each person and breaking them out of these sales scripts where they're pretending to be someone else is probably one of my greatest frustrations of all because it's like, are you really walking into a house and pretending to be someone who doesn't actually exist? Because yes. how's that going to work? Well, here's the thing, uh, because I write a lot of articles and um, people, I've always been fascinated why people want to hear what they want to hear. And it's, it's due to confirmation bias, right? Is that in cognitive dissonance is that I don't want to be taught something that is different, which doesn't confirm my vo world view. 
So therefore, let me have let me expose myself to a trainer that has been training the same thing that confirms what I, what I already know, so I feel good about myself. So I don't um, have to do the work to start again and be different. Well, is that part of it? Well, no. The the real uh, thing is, um, I don't want to be seen as someone who is uh, not knowledgeable about what I what I should be knowing in the real estate sector. So let me just learn what I've already learned because I'll feel safe about it because okay. I know it. And, yep. and, and then, we have, have the security around their mentality and their self-worth that, hey, you know, I can go to my colleague and go, see, I know it all. I, that guy was telling me, I know that. And and, and, and he's told me the stuff that's, that says all the things that confirms my activity that I'm doing at the moment now is okay. And the industry would see my work levels that I'm doing as normal. So yeah. I'm just waiting for the success to come. And, and That's because, of, you know, yeah, a lot of trainers will go into these environments and just want to make sure that they don't upset or, or ruffle feathers in the environment because then they get booked again. Well, the thing is also, um, I mean, I'm sure a lot of these trainers are well-meaning, and I would also say that a lot of them don't even know what um, high performance and growth is actually all about. Yeah. Um, they're more on the hyper thing, and um, w if you look at any kind of high-performing person, um, what they've learned is strategic thinking. Um, their ability to think strategically about where they're going, what they need to do to change, how they're going to do it. I mean, if you look at uh, classic examples, the All Blacks, right? Um, they were, they were uh, for the past four or five years, they're a very dysfunctional team because they lacked the ability of the coaches to actually think. And now uh, the New Zealand Rugby Union woke up for after a long time because they were very comfortable. They didn't want to rock the boat. They were comfortable and they had confirmation bias running through their organization. And it was only because of the results got so bad that it was going to reflect on them that they had, had, to, put, they had to change. And now yeah. Foster is, uh, is really is a dead man walking, really. He's not really a capable coach. And so what's been the difference between him and uh, Razor Robertson is that the, the innovation of thinking is what's led them to win six titles. It's what led uh, the All Blacks to win. Seven, seven now. Seven, seven titles. Sorry. I just want to make sure we had that accurate. That's all. I mean, so, and so you have the Melbourne Storm. What is the difference between them and everyone else? It's the innovation at the top has filtered down. They're not doing the same thing that every other team in the NRL is doing. The NRL teams all trying to copy uh, what Melbourne Storm are doing, but lack the skill sets, the mentality. Well, I thought the Melbourne Storm just got to the top of the ladder because they roared at the salary cap, but you know that's uh, yeah, that's a discussion for another day. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> there's a whole bunch <laughs> of stuff on there. Don't let the rules get in the way of a good story. Oh, mate, hey, I may well, not, I, I, may, I may not make it out of this office alive by the end of the day. <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna ask. I, I just want to ask this because the thing that you were saying there is. For owners and leaders in these businesses today, as a leader and as an owner of, regardless of the industry sector, I think your ability to be uh, open and um, uh, hungry for newer ideas and to challenge those those that thinking that has been around for so long is actually what many people within your business are actually looking from from the leader now and i mean yeah. we've just got a couple of leadership surveys that have come through and you know it was something like was it, it was over 80 percent of millennials coming into companies these days don't think that the current leadership is going to be able to take the business into the future and I mean, yeah. it was just amazing to see how some of that older thinking has really led us to a point now where, you know, our new crop of people coming into business are not seeing the future laid out for them. Mm. As, one, as one famous real estate trainer in Australia may describe them as little punks. Pancho, I'm sure you yeah, read yeah. that in the paper recently. 
Yeah. Well, it's yeah. just it just hit the papers here, so we're not going to talk about that today. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely a topic. <laughs> like Tom, if you're watching, <laughs> yes. <laughs> comment, please comment. <laughs> yeah. No, no, let's not carry on. Carry on. <laughs> so um, it's uh, change just is required from the top. There's no yeah. doubt about it. Um, and until that comes, then you, you're kind of destined to be on that on that hamster wheel tr spinning your wheels trying to trying to figure out if i work any harder will that be the secret to my success and um unfortunately the the the, the writing on the wall is that yes it may help you but it will take time for you to get those success metrics that you're after and you and uh, unfortunately, life rewards the intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> I think what's really interesting, Pancho, is we, we talk about the millennials and, and all this sort of stuff and, and, you know, leadership having to change from the top. But surely there also has to be a level of, you know, those who are new to the industry and there's not just millennials coming into industries like real estate and sales. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, COVID has triggered a whole lot of people to be moving from all sorts of areas into different spots. Industries, yeah, and, yeah. You know, sometimes I think there has to be, rather than, and because there is a shortage of good staff and it's expensive yeah. to change staff, is I sort of seem to often bump into or, or witness bosses or companies that are so quick to fold or or meld how they used to operate to accommodate someone new and they mm. compromise their old their old proven data driven backed systems mm -hmm. yeah. just to sort of kowtow to this new influx of new thinking and i you know surely there has to be a balance of yes the leadership has to you know always be changing from the top and evolving but You've just proven on this podcast today that the old method of, hey, making a determined number of calls between 9 and 11 every day, doing that consistently, being human about it, will lead to opportunities right, or meetings that can change your business within, you're cool. saying, seven days. Yeah. Now, that's not... Mm. that. That's almost madman ad agency type approach or Wolf of Wall Street type stuff, right? Just get going, get get on the phone, have the conversations, have the meetings. So when we talk about the millennials coming in and others from outside industries, if we're focusing on real estate, there has to be sort of a bit of a pushback from the business too to say, you know what, there's some basics here that can actually just set you up for the future. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're in sales, there are certain KPIs that you must you must meet in order for you to earn your seat. Um, I had I've got a technology company, and uh, you know they turn over two hundred million dollars a year. And the managing director, uh, which I've had to assist to calm himself down a little bit, um, will walk around to his thirty or forty salespeople, and he's a bit abrupt but he's kind of on the money. He'll actually go to one salesperson and go, did you know that space that you're occupying is costing me this amount, X amount? He says, this is what I expect in a return. So if for the folks out there who don't know technology, but usually if you get a hire a good salesperson in technology, you're paying 200,000 on target earnings. They expect $3 million in revenue in sales to be made by that salesperson in a year with at least a 20% margin. That's not being met in Australia. Mm -hmm. And so people are being fired for that. So you'll see in the papers, technology companies letting go of people. Well, it's because they're not sticking to the systems. And it was actually Gartner who came back and said that um, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the most successful people, even during COVID, were the ones who were actually calling and having conversations with clients and, and having conversations versus zoom meetings mm. yeah i agree so it's a human touch is required it's a kpi for high performance and if you can get to the discipline whereby you can do it five days a week relentlessly with the right attitude 
with the right intent, which is really important, with the right skill sets, and with the right resilience factors, I can pretty much guarantee we're coming up with a program, pretty much guarantee that you will hit your quarterly targets guaranteed. Yeah. But so this is that. Sorry, I cut you off. I cut you off there. Sorry. But here's a question because you talked that you're in technology, you're also training in real estate. So yeah. you'd know about the hype around AI in real yeah. estate at the moment. Yeah. And you know, I'm a content communications guy. So I'm fully getting pushback from people who are refusing to make human based videos and saying, I'm just going to get chat GPT to make mm -hmm. my videos and my content for me. Yeah. Look at yeah. the smile on his face, Darren. I've hit something here. We've struck yeah. a little bit of reef of gold. Yeah. Now you must in the sale, look, look, I'm almost tempted right now to get onto chat GPT and say, <laughs> write me the perfect cold call sales script. Yeah. And there will be people who do that right now. Yeah. yeah. It's not going to work, is it? Yeah, execute it. Now execute, execute it. it. Execute it. Yeah. Execute it. See, what, what most people fail to understand when you get really good at, um, in technology, they split up the sales function into two areas. They call what they call SDRs, which are the guys that actually get the appointments for the sales guys. So in real estate, you, you, you got lead generators in other terminology. But what salespeople don't understand is that the better you get at, at setting appointments and making the phone calls, the better you get at listening to tone, the better you get at listening and deciphering that a word said with a different tone has a different meaning psychologically. And, and so when you are on the call, uh, you are, you're profiling people. Uh, my background is in profiling, right? So Facebook profile you, Google profile you, Amazon profiles you, right? It's all based on mathematics. Um, so behavior is very mathematically measured. So what we're trying to do is can you, if you make 60 calls in a day, could you actually say to me, that of those conversations that you had with people, say 10 people, you could actually accurately describe to me what, who you're dealing with, what their triggers were, what you would say to them, how they would respond to a pressure point. Can you actually understand that to that level? Because if you can, you're going to be one of those rare people that is what we call a hunter, a rainmaker that virtually goes in and closes virtually every deal. Now that is what you learn by picking up the phone and mastering that because when you take, when you go into a face to face meeting with a client, your skill sets for listening to tone go to a high level, yep. your ability to actually decipher the psychology and the, and the attitude and behaviors of your client go to a high level. This is, this is not a numbers game. This is what uh, is promoted by all the sales trainers in this industry. It's a numbers game, mate. It's a numbers game because actually they don't know any better. It just it hurts me when you say, because that's exactly what you hear, right? Is it's just got to get to do the numbers. You got to do the numbers, go make more calls, make more calls. And you go, but each individual one of those calls is somebody that will sell their home. It's just when. Mm. when right? When, yeah, when, when I do a review of a call session, because we have a technology that now actually listens to calls, um, which is quite cool. But I'll, I'll actually ask a salesperson and go, okay, you're on that call. Tell me about what you think the profiles of that self, of that client is. Yeah. And, and, and I give them a, a, a profile and sheet. So they need to be able to understand what to listen for. And after a while they go, this person is this, this person is that, this is how they will do it, this is that, and this, they've got all this information from a conversation. Love it. That's profiling. That's it, and ChatGPT and AI won't do that. No. You won't get that. No, you and won't. And this is what, and, and this is, and this is the outcome, and I make this point too. All the real estate agents out there at the moment getting AI to create their Instagram posts and things like that, what they're not realizing is that ChatGPT only references real estate data from 2001 and earlier. Mm, so yep. all your content is actually out of context for the current market by about two years. So you're mm. looking really silly and out of touch with your market at the moment. So just please stop. 
Yeah. That's and, it. The other thing, and the other thing is with ChatGPT, when you put your content in there, it's shared with everyone. We we never use ChatGPT. Oh, you're don't... losing all your IP. That's right. So we oh. never use it to. Uh, we never use it for that purpose at all. I says we are not putting our content into ChatGPT for everyone else to get a benefit of because it's it's my thinking. So I'm not sharing that with anyone. Good work. Pancho, this has been an amazing conversation. Darren, you got any other angles we want to go on? I think this is yeah, the cold call king we're dealing with here at the moment. I think we need well, to get um, well, we've gone Pancho down this on, on another gone, episode. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say because we've gone down this this topic, and I think for, for the way the market is, it is so relevant for for where the markets are at, regardless of industry. And I think you know, uh, for us to be maybe. Uh, you know, I'd like to do another episode with with Pancho somewhere down the track because I think the big thing for me here is, you know, when you look at our three topics and the way those three topics work together is that all of a sudden you're starting to get some real insights into how to move your business forward and how to change your business in a, in a, in a new direction. So I think sort of the opportunity for us to, to be, maybe do something a little bit differently down the track, I think would be a, would be a great idea. But you know, when you, when you look at the content that we've, we've dug into today, if you can, as a listener, take that on board, look at your notes that you've got written down in front of you and just go, right, let me go and apply this in my business don't worry about the failure. Don't worry about the, the 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 not quite getting the script perfect and just going on the journey of improvement. Man, the the, the opportunities and the success that Pancho is talking about is is right at your fingertips. Within seven days. Within seven, seven days. days. So Pancho, if you've got any spare time over the next seven days, I've got a list I might want to send you. <laughs> no, you're not. It's you're making order. those. It's in don't you dare. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I've put, I've organised you. Just go, just straight one after the other. Don't pretty you, simple. Dear. Yeah. That's uh, Mr. Creeks. That's uh, Mr. Creeks. I'll, I'll be like a pig and slop. That's yeah, it. I'm just giving him what he wants, Darren. He enjoys this sort of stuff. Like, I, who John am I to hold him back from it? Who am I to deprive Punch of the opportunity to call on the people? Like your calls. It's all this fun. is the game. This is the game that goes on, Puncher, all the time. It's just that he's looking for the shortcut. And as we've said in this podcast, there isn't one. you got to do the calls. I'm just trying to help a guy enjoy it. Like, you know, if he had an electric <laughs> skateboard, I'm sure he'd send it my way to let me go and ride it. <laughs> it's, been a blast. it's been a blast. Pancho, thank you very much. It's been awesome. Uh, you can see his website right there if you're watching it on YouTube. But if you're listening, because we are across all podcast platforms, Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts, it is www.frontier, if you can't spell, F-R-O-N-T-I-E-R-P.com.au. It's been a blast. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. You've opened my eyes to the psychology of it. Don't go past the sale. Just get the appointment. Make the calls, get in a rhythm, organize your database in your desk and just have a crack, I think is probably one of the main keys, right? You, once you start, your confidence will grow. Absolutely. Confidence comes from the doing. Stunning. Not from the, not from the thinking. There we go. Great place to finish it. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Awesome Thank work. You. Thank it's you. It's been Blink Podcast episode, uh, Season 2, Episode 5. Peace. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye.